From the JAMA Network, this is JAMA Surgery Author Interviews. Conversations with authors exploring the latest clinical research, reviews, and opinions featured in JAMA Surgery. Welcome JAMA Surgery listeners. This is Amalia Cochran, the web and social media editor for JAMA Surgery. And I'm here today talking about the association of trauma with long-term risk of death and immune-mediated or cancer disease in same-sex twins. A programming note for our listeners. Dr. Eskison, one of our interviewees, was unable to be in a quiet place during the time of this interview, so there may be some background noise. We hope that it doesn't impair your enjoyment of this episode. The authors for this study are Dr. Trina Eskison. Hello, thank you. And then Dr. Jacob Steinmetz. Hi, thanks for having us. Dr. Eskison and Steinmetz are at the Riggs Hospitalet in Copenhagen, Denmark. I'm always eager to learn more about why a topic was identified by investigators as a question of interest. Can you please tell me more about why you wanted to pursue the question of the impact of trauma on premature mortality and the development of immune-mediated disease or cancer? Sure. So especially after bigger traumas, we know that there is a rapid and very immense immune response. And we know that this happens right after the trauma, but we don't know if this immune response also has implications in the long term. On the other hand, when we study long-term outcomes of trauma, we usually study this in terms of death or return to work or quality of life. So this is a different way of looking at the long-term outcomes of trauma Now, taking this immune response that we know happens right after trauma into consideration, we started thinking about if this could also have implications long term and if this was something that would be interesting to study. So that was actually why we came up with it. So actually, Trina has just finished her PhD and the broader aspect of that was called long-term effects of trauma. So this is one of the studies in her PhD. And in Denmark, we have a unique opportunity to do long-term follow-up studies because we have some administrative registries that are ideal for following up. Basically, you can regard our country as an entire country of a cohort. So it was a unique opportunity to go use those registries to do a different kind of follow-up study for trauma. And that's why we use this strategy. And that's perfect because the next thing I wanted to ask you about was your study design. In many places, a cohort twin study would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to conduct. And it appears that there are two Danish registries that really made your design possible, as you mentioned. Can I get you to please describe the twin registry and the national patient registry to our listeners? Yeah, so I can start with the twin registry. So in the Danish twin registry, The way that twins are included in the twin registry is that they're not included consecutively, but in cohorts. So right now, the twin registry has included twins until 2009. And then at some point, they will include twins from 2009 until wherever we are now or at the time we are now. But they do get all twins born in Denmark and they can then link the twins in the registry to all the other registries we have in Denmark, where the National Patient Registry is one of them. And the National Patient Registry holds health data for all hospital contacts in Denmark, also emergency room contacts and outpatient contacts for all Danish citizens. So that's why we thought those two registries were ideal. All Danish citizens are assigned a unique uh, central personal register number, which is similar to the social security number in the U.S. We are not as uh, scared as Danish citizens to be in a register, so it's totally reliable. We have it assigned at birth and we have it until death or immigration to another country. So you just need this personal register number in all kinds of services across our society. So we use it for healthcare visits, which is publicly funded. So Everyone needs it and everyone is going to the hospital using it. We also use it for social subsidy, like when you go on maternity leave or you retire, you are unemployed, or you use it for education and you use it for banking services and to have your internet or whatever. I mean, you just use it for many various aspects of our society. 
and you cannot change your number. It's just something you have for the rest of your life. So it's very reliable once you're in it and that you can basically merge a lot of registries in Denmark. And the two registries, like Trina said, the Trin registry and the Danish patient registry are very reliable. So you cannot visit a hospital without being put into this registry. It's not optional. Everyone that visits outpatient or in-hospital clinics, they are registered. And for which disease? And I did have a question regarding the twin registry. And Trina, you sort of alluded to this. I think your last year of data that you had twin registry data for was 2009. And it sounds like that that's simply the last year that's available right now because of how they put new data in in cohorts. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, that's correct. But that being said, we only included twins who were born until 2000 because we needed them to be adults at the time of trauma. So we stopped collecting data in 2018. So at that time, it was only the twins born in 2000 that would be 18 or older. So for our study, it didn't really matter if we had data until now or until 2018 when we stopped data collecting. What was the greatest challenge that you faced with designing and conducting this study? And I'm now even in my head trying to put that in the context of knowing that this was part of your PhD work. Correct. It was part of my PhD, so it was kind of a bigger work. But I think for this particular study, the biggest challenge was that we wanted to get a measure of trauma severity for the patients we included. And as we do not have ISS in the National Patient Registry, and we also did not have access to medical records because we only have the data that is in the registry, which is a lot, but it's not medical records. So we needed a, another way to describe the severity of trauma as we only wanted to include trauma patients who had some degree and not minor trauma, not just like a single broken arm or something like that. So we ended up with one of these ICD to ISS conversion tools that could give us an indication of the ISS. And we use that, although it has some limitations, but we use it in a way that we wanted to just identify moderate to severe trauma. And in that way, I think it was actually quite useful. Yeah, I would say COVID-19, because we actually planned this study some years ago, and we had to wait during COVID-19 for things to roll and to have access to the administrative databases. So basically there was a time period in Denmark at least where the only approvals and data you could get would be if it was concerning COVID-19 and this is not. So I think that also was challenging. I'm glad that the ISS was mentioned because I was fascinated with the information in Supplemental Table 2 because of the consistency of the findings that those in the lowest ISS grouping demonstrated the highest hazard ratio for each outcome. So the least injured patients from a multi-trauma perspective were the ones with the worst outcomes over time. In the manuscript, you included several possible explanations for this. And I'm curious if you think one of those is more likely than the others. Yeah, so we totally agree with you. It's very surprising and it is counterintuitive. I mean, you would expect the opposite, right? So that you would expect that the higher the ISS, the higher the hazard ratio of a disease. So it came to our surprise. But I mean, we give three explanations in the paper and I'm not sure which of those three is the correct one. I think they're all three doable. It can be the conversion tool of ICD to ISS that is inappropriate or not very um, correct, very precise. In the previous paper, we showed a moderate agreement between the ISS that was done by certified AIS coders and the ISS in the conversion tool. So it's not precise, but it can work to some extent. And in this paper, we were not interested in the precise ISS injury severity score. We were not interested in the exact number of that injury severity score. We were only interested in finding a cohort of patients that had moderate to severe trauma. So 
it didn't matter for us if the ISS was 16 or 32, actually. We just wanted to have trauma patients that had some kind of at least moderate to severe trauma. So we wanted to omit the very minor trauma patients. So that was the reason. Secondly, you can say that there might not be a linear relationship between the severity of trauma and the long-term health prognosis. So even though it is counterintuitive, well, maybe it's just not that way. We can't tell. And third, the injury severity score is a measure of anatomical injury, but it may not be an exact measure of the immunological imprint that is caused by the trauma. So that is definitely also a possibility. I don't know which one of those three that we prioritize. Do you have an opinion of that, Trine? I would highlight the third reason that you are discussing here. I think it is very likely that anatomical injury does not equal immune response and that we might not be able to use a measure like ISS, which is only anatomical injury. And we might not be able to use that to say something about the degree of immune response. What do you view as the most impactful finding from your study? Well, if I'm to answer first, I would say that I think the most impactful thing was that we had such robust results in all outcomes and across all subgroups. I think that's a very strong finding. And that was also, I'd say, surprising to us that we found such a strong association between trauma and these undesirable outcomes. I totally agree. But I think that the potential effect of these results is that we might need to view trauma in a different way. So we know that you can die from trauma and you know that you have difficulty of working, maybe if you broke your arm or whatever in the trauma. But those are direct effects of trauma. But I think sometimes as a clinician, you sometimes meet patients that you think they are very unlucky. So they experience physical trauma. And on top of that, they even get some other disease later. And maybe we should see this new disease actually as a complication of the trauma that potentially happened some years previously and not consider those diseases as a completely independent event. So maybe it's not just the chance finding, but it's the whole trajectory of the patient's life that comes into play. And that is very noteworthy and it's surprising and scaring in some ways. I think also it was a little surprised, I forgot to mention previously, that there was no relationship between trauma and the development of cancer. But I think that maybe our follow-up period was too short. We had a median follow-up of eight and a half years up to, I think it was 23 years. But it takes time to develop cancer. We didn't see any association between the trauma and the development of cancer. My last question is, do you have any future projects that are extensions of this work that you're planning to pursue? When it comes to the future projects, we cannot disclose too much, but I think the area, Trine will look into the immunological impact of trauma. So she's actually looking at the epigenetic effects of trauma. Maybe you are able to tell a little bit about it without disclosing the results, of course. Yes, I sure will. So as Jacob is saying, I think what the next step would be and what the next natural step could be is to start exploring the potential mechanisms that links or may link trauma and these undesirable outcomes. And one way that we are doing this is that we have explored the epigenetic alterations after severe trauma. And we have a project that has almost been finished. And I can't tell about the results, but I definitely think that there is something interesting in the whole epigenetics field and trauma that can be explored a lot more. And we have only taken the first very small step with the study that we have coming up, but I think there's a lot more to explore in that field. That is incredibly exciting. I can't wait to see what you all have because 
you obviously have such a rich source of data with your patient population and how incredibly organized your healthcare system is in Denmark. Dr. Steinmetz and Dr. Eskison, thank you both so much for your time today. I loved getting the chance to sit down and talk to both of you. Thanks so much for being here. It was a great pleasure. This episode was produced by Shelley Steffens and Daniel Musisi at the JAMA Network. To follow this and other JAMA Network podcasts, please visit us online at jamanetworkaudio.com. Thanks for listening.